Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, if you're like me, you go back and forth between uh, being unable to continue business as usual because of the crazy state of uh, the, co the pandemic and, and other things right now, or to being incredibly relieved to talk about work like everything is normal. So uh, depending on what state of mind you're currently in, uh, uh, I'm very grateful for the chance to speak with you today. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, the Department of Energy's uh, exascale Earth system model, uh, as Donna just said, uh, and the most of our work uh, is with this team that you see here with uh, Andrew Bradley, Arsana Guba, Mark Taylor, uh, all at Sandia. Uh, and I'm going to show some work uh, by Matt Norman, uh, who's at Oak Ridge. And then, of course, there's the whole E3SM team, which is about 80 to 100 people in total. Uh, so that accounts for the many others. Um, so today's talk, uh, we're going to discuss uh, several uh, various challenges that we encounter when we when we do climate and weather modeling. Uh, and some of these challenges are, are physical and just the properties of the, the continuum equations that we try to solve. Some of these challenges are related to computing algorithms and hardware. And uh, I'm going to tell a little bit of a sea story. Uh, as Donna mentioned, I was in the Navy for for a little while. Uh, then we'll talk uh, primarily about climate today and so we'll, we'll at first introduce how climate projections are different than weather forecasting um, and then you know there's it's it's kind of unsatisfying to talk about challenges without also presenting some solutions so um, I will start out by saying that every challenge requires better algorithms uh, it doesn't matter how good the hardware gets uh, the best GPU won't save you from a bad algorithm and so our approach is to try to come up with uh, strategies that are based on compact high order data. So for example, spectra elements uh, can, can, uh, can, can accomplish that. And then to, to, do, to do algorithms that, that are capable of remaining stable even at large time steps. So specifically today, we'll introduce uh, two semi-Lagrangian methods that we've tailored for the E3SM model specifically although they are more generally applied to, to numerical transport in any multi-physics uh, model. Uh, we have a new shape, a new approach to shape preservation that we call communication efficient density reconstruction that is actually uh, has a lot of very nice um, provable properties in, in the theorem proof context. Uh, we have a new upwind communication pattern which um, sort of blurs the line between physics and computing um, and then uh, we have a, a new grid coarsening strategy that actually reduces the cost in, of a huge part of the model by, by half. And so the combined effect of the semi-Lagrangian transport algorithms and this grid coarsening approach, um, we've, we've effectively doubled the speed of the atmosphere model um, at all resolutions and uh, across all uh, node counts from the very small node counts where the GPUs are occupied and the workload is high to the very high node counts which we require to get the throughput you need for a climate model. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is make the point that models actually do really well. Uh, it's, it's really easy to focus on uh, their deficiencies, especially when it's your job to work on those deficiencies. Um, but the, but the truth is they do really, really, really well. It, and the, it's becoming uh, apparent that half the challenge or more is in just translating the model output uh, into the general public or to decision makers. Um, and an example uh, that one of my undergraduate professors like to give is that one of the best mo numerical modeling successes was viewed by the public as one of its worst failures. Um, and that was the 1996 blizzard on the East Coast. Uh, the models forecast it hitting Washington DC and Philadelphia um, with, with a certain intensity and a certain time. And it hit with that exact intensity at that time, but it hit New York and Boston instead. So from a numerical modeling point of view, it was a fantastic success. They got the intensity right. They got the timing right. They were off by one grid point. It just so happened that 50 million people live between those two grid points and so uh you know oops um so uh so what you see here in this plot is a plot of the tropical cyclone um 
forecast track error at the 24 hour, 48 hour and 72 hour forecast between 1974 and 2014. And it's just because I haven't updated this slide that I don't have more uh, up to date data. And you can see that uh, the way I like to view this is to draw two horizontal lines. And so you see, for example, that between 2002 and 2014, forecast scale improved by a full 24 hours. Right. If you if you follow those horizontal lines, the 72 hour forecast in 2014 is as accurate as the 48 hour forecast was. Um, so each group of forecasts has two lines. One is the the actual uh, average track error for each year, and one is the five year running average. And the part that's shaded in green is actually the time that uh, I spent on shore duty at this weather forecasting center. So there's a local minimum there, but it's, it's no big deal. <laughs> so, um, so one of the before I was a forecaster, I was actually on on board this uh, destroyer, the, the USS Shoop, and we were in the Eastern Pacific on a deployment in 2004. I'm getting old, but that's not ancient. We had good satellites then. We had good models. Uh, the seven day forecast called for typical tropical weather, spotty showers, trade winds. When I took the watch on the bridge at 630 in the morning, we had northeast wind at 10 knots and it was overcast. When I turned the watch over to the next officer of the deck at 1130, we checked the wind again. It had stayed the same speed, but it had shifted from northeast to west. Uh, but now the sky was clear. Um, but when you're in the northern hemisphere and winds shift in the counterclockwise direction, literally centuries of maritime knowledge say you're in big trouble. Uh, so, you know, we do what we have to do. We called the captain and the captain said, get on the satellite phone and call the weather center. Um, the Navy actually calls them weather guessers. Um, but so we, we called the weather center and they looked at the satellites that were up to date for the last to the last half hour. They looked at the model, which was up to date to the last three hours. And they said, nothing to worry about, stay on your mission. Sure enough, 25 hours later, we were dodging a hurricane. So, so what happened? Neither observations nor the models showed any indications of bad weather. So this brings us to our first challenge. Uh, we have multiple scales in weather and climate forecasting, and they're related by nonlinear dynamics. So in this particular case, we are in the Eastern Pacific, and there are lots of coastal mountains on the, on the western coast of the Americas that introduce small scale vortices into the boundary layer. Some of those vortices can find favorable environments and grow. None of these beginning stages are resolved by even high resolution weather models. And without clouds in those vortices, they are not visible to satellites. So that's what happened. And uh, favorable for a tropical cyclone means these five criteria. These were our rules of thumb at the forecasting center. If you had a low level circulation center moving over high sea surface temperatures uh, greater than 26 Celsius, with a latitude of greater than five degrees, that's so that there's sufficient Coriolis force for rotation. Uh, if you combine that with a little bit of upper level divergence and low amounts of vertical wind shear, probability is you're going to get a tropical cyclone. And that's that's what happened uh, when our ship was in that area. So how does this work? Well, there's there's just one uh, one example is is turbulence theory. So the, the atmosphere uh, is sort of a vanishingly thin layer of fluid at the large scales on a gigantic sphere uh, or sphere shaped planet. So it's at, at large scales, it's well approximated by 2D turbulence theory, which suggests that kinetic energy cascades from high wave numbers to small wave numbers. It, trans, it transfers from small scales to large scales. However, entropy tends to cascade to small scales. So the rotational effects and, and the vortices transfer to small scales. But as you move down the spatial scale or up the wave number, uh, you, you approach 3D turbulence theory where kinetic energy now also cascades to the smaller scales. And atmospheric flow um, at the large scales, uh, you know, empirically approximately 80% of the kinetic energy moves up 
uh, in wavelength and 20% goes down and entropy is sort of the opposite. And there's this transition region at the scale of around 100 kilometers where there's nonlinear actions between waves and vortices that can cause things like vortices to grow. And so that's just one of these challenges um, that we find in the physics of our planet. And that's just physics, right? There's, there's all kinds of other even smaller scales due to chemistry. Um, and one of the projects I'm working on now is an aerosol model for the DOE's climate model, where the actual nanometer scale shapes of particulate matter and, and droplets suspended in the atmosphere truly affect the shape and the dynamics of clouds at the hundreds of meter to kilometer scale. So it, there's multi-scale dynamics all over the place in our atmosphere, and that's, that's really hard to capture. In addition, they tend to be chaotic systems, which means that they have a sensitive dependence on initial conditions, as famously demonstrated by Lorenz. Uh, so the Lyapunov time for the atmosphere is 10 to 14 days. So even if you have uh, you know, a field that is initialized with a difference in the 14th or 15th bit uh, of, of initial data, after 14 days or so, the instantaneous solution of the atmospheric model equations will be indistinguishable from each other. And that's kind of shown here in this uh, famous Lorenz attractor picture on the right. We start a red ball and a green ball uh, very, very close to each other. And they, 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 they're attracted to this fuzzy manifold, um, but they end up really, really far apart. Um, and that turns into uh, uh, very, very difficult to to solve equations or to, to make long-term projections, it becomes very difficult. So, and here's the primary difference between weather forecasting and climate projections. In weather forecasting, we actually care about whether we're the red ball or the green ball. We want that deterministic forecast. But in climate projections, that's impossible because the time scale of a climate projection is well beyond the Lyapunov time. So in climate, our goal is really to uh, try to describe that manifold or that attractor. And we don't even know what dimension of phase space it lives in uh, as, a, as a community. So the best thing we can do right now is, is on forward simulations and ensembles. Um, and we have this question of um, how do we, if we change the model, whether we change an algorithm to improve its comp computational performance, or maybe we change the microphysics parameterization to capture more of what we think uh, are the physically appropriate processes. Um, sometimes when we run those in the coupled model, even an, an improved parameterization will degrade this quality of the, the climate relative to past data. So you need, we need to figure out a way to, to quantify how different climate model solutions are the same in some statistical sense of, of climatology. And that's a, that's a really difficult research problem that a lot of people are working on that unfortunately I won't have much time to talk about today. But if there are some uh, young people in the audience that have some good ideas, we'd really like to uh, encourage them in that area. Uh, so let's look at where we are now. So the state of numerical weather prediction um, we can run a global spatial resolution of between one and 10 kilometers on a time scale of 10 to 14 days. And at these time scales, you, you, you need a coupled uh, atmosphere and ocean model, but each model component has resolved scales and unresolved scales. For example, we have no chance of resolving the nanometer shapes of aerosol particles in the atmosphere. So those get parameterized as unresolved processes. But also at these time scales for weather prediction, you have the luxury of being able to assume that boundary conditions for uh, things that are relatively slow on this time scale, and you don't have to simulate them. So vegetative processes, land fluxes of soil moisture can be simulated by data instead of having to be uh, computationally uh, prognosed. As we move forward uh, and increase the time scale, uh, we have to compensate by reducing the spatial resolution just by the limits of computing resources. So what happens as we transition from weather to climate is we increase the spatial resolution or we decrease, we increase the spatial scales and decrease the resolution. So we lose cloud systems. Those are, those are no longer resolved well in a climate model. And all of these boundary conditions 
when you when you go out to the time scale of decades or more, those can't be just boundary conditions anymore. They have to be simulated. And so the current atmosphere models or the current climate models rather, uh, at least in the DOE sense, but this 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 holds broadly across uh, many international modeling centers is uh, you have a coupled system of individual components. So now the entire atmosphere model is one component of a coupled climate model. And now we also have full model components for sea ice, land ice, land and ocean. And so this is where we are now. Um, the DOE climate model runs at 25 kilometer resolution. The latest IPCC simulations run at 100 kilometers resolution. The reason the DOE runs at higher resolutions is because we have the luxury of being able to run on the gigantic DOE computers, but also because the DOE mission is a time scale of 40 to 50 years, whereas the IPCC mission is a time scale of 100 to 200 years. So we, we can afford to run at higher resolution for those two reasons. Um, in the next five years, DOE research is directed at developing a three kilometer global atmosphere model that will be coupled to the climate system. At this scale, we ten year, a 10 year simulation is you know, a month of time on the entirety of DOE summit machine, which is number two on the top 500 list right now. Um, but we hope, so, so we're not going to do climate with that model. It's just computationally impossible. What we are going to use it for is to sort of, it, it, it resolves so many more things that are unresolved in the typical climate models that we want to use it to validate our subgrid parameterizations with this, you know, we hope that the processes that are resolved in this three kilometer model can be uh, compared to their parameterizations in the lower resolution model. Uh, we're running 25 kilometers fully coupled to try to do uh, robust 40 year projections. And, and the, the mission statement is to provide actionable information, uh, information with uncertainty quantifications uh, and confidence levels uh, to the point where uh, policymakers can make decisions about where it might need a seawall or where uh, water resources should be directed. Uh, for example, in New Mexico and Colorado and anywhere in the Rio Grande or any Western river, um, that's a big deal. Uh, where there might be more flooding, uh, for example, the Southeast United States just had five hurricanes hit Louisiana just this summer. Um, so those are the kind of things at the regional scale uh, that we're hoping our climate model will be able to provide. And that brings us into some of the computing challenges. We require lots of uh, measures of uh, accuracy and fidelity from the algorithms that we use. Um, I'm coming from a math department. So, um, you know, high order accuracy was, was prioritized in all my numerical methods classes. Uh, when you go into climate modeling, um, mass conservation is prioritized higher than order of accuracy because over the time scales of a climate simulation even if your really small high order truncation error um, is pretty good uh, over 300 years of simulations uh, that can add up to be a sufficiently different planet that you can't trust your climate model so conservation becomes the highest priority for climate modeling um, and then there's this, this completely artificial requirement that we have tracer continuity consistency. And this is because in to, to have a good climate model, you have you evolve lots of trace species in the atmosphere. So on the order of 40 to 100. And the number of prognostic variables, for example, in the Euler equations is on the order of 10. Um, so you have many, many more tracer uh, species advective in the atmosphere. And so just for concerns of computational efficiency, we tend to solve the tracer advection equations separately from the dynamics equations. Um, and that creates a problem because the tracer advection equation is not independent from the continuity equation. And so if you're solving the continuity equation and the advection equation with different methods, um, then you may have inconsistency in the representation of your atmospheric density, and that can cause problems in your model solution. So we require that they're consistent. 
course, we have shape preservation so that our solutions uh, maintain physically realizable states. And of course, we care about computational efficiency. And all of these are hard because the way we're getting computational efficiency these days is with new architectures uh, that include many core CPUs, uh, like the, the new Intel Skylakes, um, or, or GPUs, which are completely different memory and execution spaces that makes programming more difficult. In addition, a lot of them uh, tend to require different programming languages and not just different programming semantics. Uh, so if you're not a computer science person, um, that is a, is a whole new curriculum of material that you need to learn to be able to do your job. Uh, and then all of that is compacted even more by the very high throughput requirements that we need to do climate science effectively. Uh, to run a 40 year simulation, uh, and then an, uh, it requires a, hurt, a certain amount of throughput, but then you have, you have to remember that we wanna do uncertainty quantification too. So it's not just running one 40 year simulation, it's running whole ensembles. And so that makes the computational challenges very, very difficult. So we'll go into a little bit more detail now about the E3SM model and how we, we confront these challenges and, and some of the, and how, and how we hopefully overcome a few of them too. So the, the E3SM model uses what's called the shallow atmosphere approximation. Uh, and the idea here is that the, the, the atmosphere is just a vanishingly thin layer of fluid discretized uh, in the vertical separately from its discretization in the horizontal. Um, so the dynamics equations are solved on horizontal spectra elements. The default is a cubic element shown in blue here on the figure. And then at each um, gauss lobato node, there is a physical column uh, shown here in red. And on that physical column, there will be uh, I think our default right now is 72 stacked levels. So you can imagine 72 blue elements stacked on each column. But um, one of the, for, for computational efficiency, we treat each column independently, which allows us to parallelize over the columns. Um, and then we also do some uh, implicit explicit splitting. So the terms of the dynamics equations that are associated with vertical acoustic waves are treated implicitly. Uh, because they they turn to they tend to uh, carry a small amount of energy, but they are so. Uh, if you if you want to resolve them, the current uh, number restriction is uh, very very strict, and so we treat them implicitly to get around that. But the the main point of this picture is that um, even as we refine when we refine the mesh in a climate model, when we increase the spatial resolution, we're talking about horizontal. Uh, even between the, so for example, if we increase the spatial resolution in our 100 kilometer runs by a factor of four down to 25 kilometers, the vertical, we don't change that much. It only, it only doubles from around 30 to 72. So for climate, the workload is measured by the horizontal discretization. And that is where the throughput challenges come from. So if we can abstract the idea of workload into this cube here, um, to meet our scientific goals for regional projections, we estimate that we have to run our coupled climate model at approximately 2000 times real time. We need better than five simulated years per actual day. And one of the ways that we try to address all those multi-scale dynamics problems that we talked about at the beginning is through spatial refinement. But if you increase the resolution by a factor of two, you have to also decrease your time step by the same amount. And so uh, a 2x spatial refinement translates into eight times more work. But we have to keep the same throughput in order to meet our science goals. So we use our big computers and we spread that work over eight nodes or, or, or eight times more resources, uh, generally nodes. And you can see the problem right here is that the work is no longer distributed evenly. So the work per node actually decreases by half with every 2x grid refinement. And that's really bad on modern computers because it implies large MPI overheads where some nodes are waiting for other nodes to finish. And it doesn't wait long. I mean, it's, these times are measured in milliseconds, but over a full month of a climate simulation, those milliseconds add up to a lot of downtime that your computing resources are doing nothing. Plus, um, 
accelerators like GPUs, uh, they reward high workloads and, and they actually don't do very well when they don't have much work to occupy them. And so the more we push grid refinement, the, the, we actually reduce the workload for these accelerators because the work per node is decreasing. So uh, because of these time step reductions uh, that are required by, by the current number, um, grid refinement is not really our friend uh, when it comes to computational efficiency. So this brings us to paths forward and we need algorithms that are insensitive to uh, that association between spatial resolution and time step. So really what you want to do is maximize the realism in some quantifiable way per unit of data movement, because what makes all those um, computational operations inefficient is the, the is because we have um, uh, communi communications required between the nodes and that movement of data is what takes the longest in a, in a parallel computing environment. So uh, we want to minimize the cost per parallelizable degree of freedom. Um, generally, if you can parallelize something, it's okay to add, uh, especially if you can put it on something like a GPU. Uh, if you can add work that parallelizes easily relative to the cost of moving that work, even from one CPU to an attached GPU, um, the cost of that work is negligible relative to that data movement. So strategies that we have, have looked into and that have worked are high order algorithms, uh, but because they're high order, they require good limiters. And what you're doing here is you're adding more resolution per degree of freedom. Um, we're, we're looking at methods that really push the bounds of numerical stability uh, by being capable of using large time steps. And there is a whole field of what's called super parameterizations. Um, and the idea with super parameterization and some references are listed there in the, in the bottom right because I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, the idea with the super parameterization is you run a 2D LES model at high resolution with periodic boundary. So each column uh, in this picture here, each red column is replaced with a 2D LES model. And the idea is that it's still, it's still artificial, right? It's 2D with periodic boundary conditions. There's no communication between each column still, but the hope is that it's a more faithful representation of the column physics because you're actually solving, uh, you know, the Navier-Stokes equations in, in, in in 2D with a full LES model instead of just doing 1D finite differences with parameterizations on each column. Uh, and so, th and the, the, the other thing with super parameterization is, is those 2D LES models can be run on the GPUs very well uh, independently of each other. And so th those ideas are, are uh, being investigated by several people at DOE, uh, Matt Norman and Walter Hanna in particular. Uh, and then we also mentioned that um, we really don't know where the architecture will go in the next five years. DOE is buy, buying into GPUs heavily. Every DOE machine for the next four years, five years will be a GPU machine. Um, but the ones that come after that may not be. Or they might be GPUs built by, like for example, one, one, D, one DOE lab is buying NVIDIA GPUs. The other one is buying AMD GPUs. They use different programming languages. So you don't want to maintain two different versions of your code, it becomes a maintenance nightmare. So you need some tool. And because I work at Sandia, I use the Sandia product, which is called Cocos. Um, it's a meta programming model. It's entirely written in C++ and it uses uh, C++ 11's uh, new standard meta programming ideas to abstract away the differences between architectures. So the idea is you compile Cocos for an OpenMP machine or you compile Cocos for a CUDA machine. Um, and then as long as you write all your code in Cocos, it will work on those two various machines. And it succeeds at that, which is kind of astounding. If you've ever tried to write code for a GPU and then try to write the same code for OpenMP, it's astounding that Cocos succeeds at that. There's a little asterisk though, uh, in that even though your, your Cocos code will run on the GPU, which is an achievement all by itself, it probably won't be fast. Even with a model like Cocos, you still have to go in manually and expose all of the parallelism that is required to use a GPU well. The good news is, is that by doing that, you almost always also improve your standard CPU OpenMP code because 
uh, you, you, you really have to think about your algorithms well and you remove dependencies and even the CPU code is improved. And there are other strategies um, that I colored in red because conceptually they have a lot of potential, um, but they haven't really panned out yet. So parallel and time methods, uh, the large scale atmosphere equations are hyperbolic equations. So there is parallelism in the time dimension because different grid points that have independent uh, domains of dependence can be treated in parallel. Uh, but how do you determine which grid points are independent of the others at runtime is, is challenging. And then there, the idea of reduced order models always sounds good, um, but it hasn't really turned out to work well in climate yet. Um, machine learning could help, um, but it hasn't yet. And uh, for, I know there's machine learning is the big fad. And if you don't put it in your proposal, you're probably not going to get funded right now. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if you heard about the, uh, the two weeks ago, there was a paleontology uh, meeting and they had an AI algorithm uh, monitoring their, their chat communications. And, uh, so they were trying to discuss geological processes like cleavage and it's a paleontology conference. So they were trying to discuss, for example, uh, what you do with a bone and the AI algorithm uh, canceled all of that. They could, they could not have an effective meeting um, because of a machine learning failure, uh, which, so we got a long way to go in those two methods. However, there is a lot of potential uh, in them. It's just uh, not what, what I'm working on right now. What I'm working on are semi-Lagrangian transports uh, in the atmosphere for spectra elements. And what we have uh, developed is uh, a library we call Compose for Compact Performance Portable Semi-Lagrangian Methods. Um, and the idea is that spectra elements provide high order accuracy with compact stencils. Uh, Semi-Lagrangian time stepping gets us uh, away from the current restrictions of an Eulerian scheme. And some of the highlights that we're proud of is it's performance portable, it's GPU ready. Um, it's second order accurate in general flow. Uh, that's because of the shape preservation. Um, it dramatically reduces the MPI communication rounds relative to the Eulerian scheme that it replaced. And we have two varieties of it. We have cell integrated, uh, which is locally mass conserving and it's extensible into higher order. Uh, all you have to do is change the way you parameterize element edges from, from linear to quadratic to get cubic accuracy. Um, and it, succe it successfully sped up uh, the, the E3SM transport uh, at, in the atmosphere by, by a factor of around 2.5. Um, and then we also have just the standard 40 or 50 year old point-wise semi-Lagrangian method where you just trace a point backward in time and interpolate the tracer value that it would have there, move it forward. Um, and that actually um, is, is not a locally conservative algorithm, but if you have to correct your solution to do shape preservation anyways, it's actually not harder. It's actually mathematically equivalent to do conservation at the same time. So uh, it, and it has significantly, it has the smallest possible communication requirement. So that actually gets a speed up of 3.1 uh, over the Eulerian scheme. And that's actually what we use now. Uh, so just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, this is the transport problem. We want to solve the advection equation in either of its forms, uh, given initial conditions for the tracer mixing ratio Q. And importantly, we are given in the transport problem, the velocity and the density. Those come from a separate part of the atmosphere model that we call dynamics. So. Uh, and then we are we are assuming that we're operating at the strong scaling limit. So every element here is on a different MPI rank. So anytime there's communication required, uh, you know, for example, this red element is the one we're going to focus on in the next few slides. It has to get that data from somewhere else in the in the parallel computer. And then we have these requirements for our transport scheme. It must be exactly conservative. It must have at least second degree accuracy. Uh, it has to preserve the local bounds and it has to be mass consistent between transport and dynamics and it has to be efficient. So <clears throat> if you're familiar with semi-Lagrangian algorithms, there's a very popular form of them called flux form methods uh, and they're very good. Uh, they, they succeed at increasing the time step um, and since they're a flux form method, they are automatically conservative. 
um, because no matter how you compute the flux, you add it to one side of the edge and you subtract it from the other. So it's automatically mass conserving. The problem, as you might note from this picture, is if every one of these elements is on a different MPI rank, then the longer you increase the time step, the more data and hence the more communication you require to compute these swept regions. So the flux regions of data for each edge grows proportionally to the time step. So we decided not to do this, which makes the challenge of conservation a little harder. But if we do instead what's called a remap form semi-Lagrangian method, which works like this picture, you trace the elements image uh, forward in time and you, or, or backward in time, it doesn't matter. Um, so in this case, the red element depends on only the data from the purple elements. And you do just a, a basis to basis projection, an L2 projection. And since for quadrilaterals anyway, the average number of elements that move into another element is always around four. It's roughly independent of time step. So the communication stencils are much smaller. Uh, so in here, the communication stencil is purple. It's roughly independent of time step. The, what, what we need is a way to compute this overlap mesh, these colored regions here. And we do that by uh, just a standard polygonal intersection algorithm, where for, for each element, we compute a list of the elements it depends on. Um, and then we associate an overlap region in the colors. Uh, so this blue one comes from this element, the orange one from this one, the green from here, purple here. Um, and the key development here is that unlike traditional mess intersection algorithms, if you're, on, if you're doing high order quadrature, you don't need a watertight overlap mesh, which means you can compute it locally. So little finite difference errors in your computational geometry algorithms between is this edge exactly overlapping that one or not, um, you know, at the level of round off or truncation error, that can cause problems uh, if you require uh, a watertight mesh. But since we're doing high order quadrature um, and not like strict meshing, we, we don't require that. So all these overlap computations can be computed locally. And so there's no extra communication required for that, which works out really nice. And what you end up with is a, a basis to basis uh, projection of the distorted field uh, to the Eulerian mesh. Um, and so you, you end up on the, on the right hand side, you have this, this MK is the standard finite element mass matrix. And this uh, mixed mass matrix here is the integral of the transported basis uh, with the Eulerian basis. And so this is a, a family of methods that are characterized as Lagrange Galerkin or characteristic Galerkin. They date back to the 1980s and they're all, they all have the same feature of this transported uh, basis. So you end up with this mixed max matrix where the, the mixing refers to a transported basis function and the standard Eulerian basis function. Uh, but then you just have this local um, uh, matrix equation to solve at each element. And the mass matrices are constant, uh, so they can be prefactored and just and you just apply the solution operator every in time. So you just end up having to compute uh, two matrix vector multiplications per element. Uh, where the, the main cost is just constructing that mixed max matrix because the trajectories make that uh, time step dependent. So uh, as I mentioned, this is a lagrange galerkin method. There's some, some related work. So basic sem semi-Lagrangian methods are of course well-known. Um, they're well-known just in climate, but of course they're applied to, to other areas of physics. Um, Semi-Lagrangian transport as, a, as incremental remap is, is summarized nicely by this paper by Dukowitz and Baumgartner. Uh, general remap algorithms from spectral element meshes, the spectral element meshes are, are where we took a lot of our terminology from, like the idea of the mixed mass matrix uh, comes from this paper by Farrell. Um, and then the specific uh, type of algorithm we use uh, dates back to the 1980s from these two papers. Um, I highlighted uh, Frank Gerardo's work. He actually did the same thing for the sphere in a 1997 paper. Uh, he used triangles and had a much harder numerical quadrature problem than we have. Um, and uh, we use uh, a, a more abstract mathematical space that simplifies the quadrature problem. And this one highlighted in green uh, is important because it proves the unconditional stability of these methods uh, so that the, 
the stability of the method is independent of the time step. So we can put these into E3SM and measure how long it takes. Um, and so you see this on the plot here on the right. The there no this is time spent in the transport method, uh, normalized to the time uh, it takes the the old Eulerian method to compute a solution for 40 tracers, which is the standard operating configuration for the climate model. And you can see that the cell integrated method, this is where the 2.5 number comes from, and the interpolation method uh, is blue is even faster. Um, and the reason it's faster is because the cell integrated method, we have basis to basis interactions. Um, what the point wise method, we just send a request to the element that contains the departure point that element computes the tracer and sends the result. So it's just basis point interactions. The communications are much smaller, but we still have the, the computation or the, the challenge that uh, communication is still a limiting factor, even for this uh, blue method here. Uh, so before we talk about that, I wanna make sure that I uh, tell you how we do um, mass conservation and uh, shape preservation because if you it doesn't matter how fast you are if you can't have physically realistic solutions and you can't do mass conservation uh, your work's kind of irrelevant to the climate people um, so we do that by def what we call property preservation where we define a property uh, as any general quantity that is required to be represented exactly at least as far as you can get to exact and finite precision in an otherwise approximate numerical solution. So the total mass integral of each tracer is an example of a property. So is its upper bound and lower bound. And then we have different uh, categories of properties. A static property does not depend on the current solution. So for example, a mixing ratio is always between zero and one. Um, if it's not static, it's dynamic. It depends on the current state of your solution. Uh, a global property is relevant only to the entire domain. So global mass is a global property. Um, global positivity of density is a global property. And a local property is defined by the discrete domain of dependence. So this is where, for example, you don't want a new extremum uh, forming at a, at a particular point if that extremum doesn't already exist in, in the previous time step. And so I just wrote some of these down in a little bit more precise fashion here on this slide. So we have uh, conservation is global and static. Uh, we want the integrals to stay constant in time, but there's also a local and dynamic version of mass conservations, which says that the, the amount of mass in any Lagrangian volume has to equal the, the mass from which it came from. Uh, and of course there's positivity, which we already talked about and, and concentration um, there's a global dynamic range preservation, which means that if at your initial time you have a lower bound and an upper bound, your intermediate times should not change those bounds. And then, and this is important because that creates a safety problem. In the slides that follow, we'll talk about the optimization problem we need to solve. And, and this is important because these global bounds create an optimization problem that is always feasible. Uh, but the one we actually target uh, is local dynamic range uh, preservation so that the maxima and minimum in the discrete domain of dependence are what we preserve uh, in, our, in our problems. So here are the optimization problems. So uh, some notation, uh, capital Q is the air density that comes from the dynamic solver uh, multiplied by the tracer mixing ratio that comes from the tra transport scheme. So we have minimums uh, and maximums defined in this way. And we require that these minima and maxima are not exceeded in either direction. And this is why we call it a constrained uh, density reconstruction because we, we perform our limits uh, limiting on this tracer density and not the mixing ratio. Um, and so our, our results are in this paper where we do several uh, interesting things. Uh, for example, we can prove that you can solve this problem uh, with a certain set of properties, bounds on the amount of mass that is moved as a result of this limiting procedure. Um, and so there's a, there's a couple of predecessors. Clip and assured sum is the simplest possible thing you do where your solution exceeds the bound, you clip it, and then you add that mass back somewhere else. That's so that the sum is assured. That's the simplest possible thing you can do. And it is surprisingly effective. Uh, there's two norm minimization, which uh, 
there's a lot, several people at Sandia have worked on, and then there's other methods here that are widely used, but they have some interesting properties in the sense that, for example, neither of these are provably feasible. In fact, you can show that sometimes they're not, um, but it just happens to work out for the for the physical uh, context in which they they operate. So. Feasibility can be assured if you have what's called cell mass boundedness. So if this is the quadrature weight for an element, uh, the minimum integral in the discrete form over that element and the maximum integral uh, need to bound the solution. And if you can assure that you always have this, then that's a necessary and sufficient condition to prove that your optimization problem is always feasible. Uh, but the problem is if you have a compact high order semi Lagrangian method, you do not have this property. So you always have to move mass around to achieve this property. So you're always gonna have to move mass, which means you automatically have a non-local problem. Because if you move mass from one element to another, then that mass movement may cause the destination element to go out of bounds. And then you have to move mass from it to somewhere else. So you automatically have a globally coupled problem. And so the question is how bad is that global coupling? Uh, and in parallel computing, global coupling turns into global communications, which are bad, they are slow. Um, and in particular, this one requires an all to all reduction uh, or an all reduce in, in, in MPI shorthand. So our goal with this process is to, we wanna keep high order semi-Lagrangian methods because we want those large time steps. So we have to address this problem. So our goal is to minimize the cost and the number of these global communications. So the question is, what is the fewest number of all reduces that can guarantee conservation and property preservation? Because uh, like in two norm minimization, you do it iteratively. You, you iterate until your, your adjustments are below some tolerance, but each iteration requires an all reduce. But we showed that you can do it provably in exactly one, the smallest possible number of all reduces. And this answer is independent of the problem data. And you can prove it to yourself pretty easily with clip and assured sum. So clip and assured sum, imagine our high order solution is this green curve here. Uh, and imagine that this is London and this is Los Angeles. So we have exceeded the bounds here. So we clip it and we keep track of the mass that we clipped and we find out that you can add it back over here. So our new solution in black is the clip and assured sum solution and the black dash. It's, ex it's exactly one all reduce and ensures conservation and range, uh, but the mass movement is non-local. So we, we teleported this mass that our numerical solution located here, all the way over here to fill in this triangle. What we have developed is what we call a quasi local tree method that is also a one all reduce problem that ensures conservation and preservation, but the mass movement is quasi local, Oops, sorry. So the quilt solution to this problem is shown in red. So you can see that this triangle's mass gets moved only locally near where its peak was originally. And the zeros are maintained pretty well also. So this triangle gets sun in the same way. And the way it works is we have a pre-computing step where we build a tree over the mesh such that each leaf node of the tree is one-to-one -one with a mesh element. And so this breaks the global coupling of the mesh because now we do all our computations in the tree. And that's why it's quasi local and not local because locality is now defined in the tree and not on the mesh. So that's a pre compute step. And then at runtime, we have a two step algorithm. We have a leaves to root reduction and a root to leaves broadcast, which are equivalent to an all reduce uh, in their communication pattern. So let's just run through a tiny mesh example. So here we have a tiny mesh of four elements. I'm going to ignore boundary conditions. So the pre-compute step, we build a tree whose leaves are one-to-one -one with the mesh elements. Each element locally computes its lower bound, its mass, and its upper bound, and sends them to its parent node. Each internal node locally sums all those things and sends them up to its parent. At the root, now you have the global mass sum, the global minimum mass, and the global upper bound. And here you check feasibility. If you have cell mass boundedness, you're feasible, you can solve the problem. If you don't have that, you just change 
the lower bound to be the global lower bound and the upper bound to be the upper global bound. And now you're automatically assured feasible. We call that our safety problem. But anyhow, let's just assume that we have the nice case where it's where it's cell mass bounded to begin with. Now the root node solves the optimization problem for itself. It's a node local optimization problem uh, where you find the minimum in the, L, in the least square sense uh, that achieves these things. Um, and then you just send the results of that computation to your kids uh, so that the if there's a change in mass, capital M here, that is distributed between the, the root node's children. Um, and then they solve the same node local optimization problem and distribute any changes that they require amongst their kids. And then when you get down to the leaves, you solve an element local optimization problem that now if you have to distribute mass, you distribute it between the quadrature nodes within that element. Um, and so it, it's all local uh, in the sense of the tree, but not local in the sense with the mesh. So we test this with a conservative numerical transport scheme, specifically the cell integrated semi-Lagrangian scheme. Uh, we have our quilt scheme in red, the Bermijo Conde limiter in blue, the two norm minimization in green, clip and assured sum is purple, a straight cubic uh, interpolant with no limiter is uh, black and dashed, and the, the automatically monotone linear uh, solution is in green. And so here's the, the solution for the, for the standard you know, periodic 1D advection of three shapes. Um, and what you see is that Quilt does better than all of them uh, at maintaining the zeros and moving mass locally. Um, and, and so we're really happy with that. But as I mentioned, we're not doing mass conservative transport, right? We're doing interpolation um, semi-Lagrange, not cell integrated. So we test it there too. And since the numerical method itself now is not conservative, um, there's no way around it. You're adding global mass everywhere. You, you can't just create local mass information when you when you have none to begin with. Uh, so you, add up, you end up with a global fixer, but here still, uh, if we look at the error, uh, Quilt is maintaining the zeros better than every other method that is in common use. So at this point, I thought we'd take a breath. Uh, so we have uh, two semi-Lagrangian methods, both um, that use our Quilt shape preservation approach. Uh, when you combine the, the methods with, and, and so I should say that um, this Quilt uh, shape preservation was included in the timing results that I showed you earlier. Um, but now we still have the problem that MPI is the bottleneck. And when we work on that problem, we can increase these numbers even more. And here is the MPI problem. Um, our model used what's called a halo one communication pattern. It's predetermined at whenever you define the mesh, this element, which remember every element is on their own MPI rank, at every communication step, the blue element receives data from every single one of its neighbors, the full halo. It's deterministic and constant, which means it's simple, it's easy to code, it's less prone to error. Um, if you do the simple implementation, you send every red to the blue, you send all of them at 128 columns, which have 72 levels within them. Uh, if you work a little harder, you can you can make sure you only send the unique columns. For example, the blue, uh, you don't need to send this corner. You only need to send this blue corner from one of these. You don't need to send it from all three. Uh, you can do that and you, you only have to send 84 columns uh, times the number of levels worth of data. What we've, doing, we've done is we've developed this um, upwind communication pattern. So we compute the local trajectories from the data in the blue. So now the blue element knows where its departure points go. So it sends a request to this element to compute the interpolated tracer values for each of these purple points. And this can be done asynchronously. So then the red has the compute load using data that is already local to the red element. And then it just sends the result of that computation back to the blue. So there's a handshake, right? The blue has to figure out where its data need to come from, but that can be done asynchronously and it turns out to be a negligible communication cost. And then the step two is the red does the computations and sends the results back. So we completely eliminate all of these data transfers in this cartoon. Uh, 
So we've illustrated what in the previous slide was either 128 or 84. In this illustration, it's 17. And if you do the pathological example where all 16 of these blue points end up in all eight of these elements, the upper bound worst case scenario is 32 uh, columns times the number of levels. So we can measure the improvement in performance we gain from just changing the software implementation of, of this upwind MPI. So on two different architectures. So here we have a standard CPU Haswell. It's from the Edison computer, if you're familiar with that. And then we have uh, from Corey's uh, KNL, which is a multi-core accelerator. Um, and they behave a little differently. This behaves more like a, a standard accelerator where the performance gains improve as you increase the workload. Here we measure the workload and the number of tracers. Um, but in each case, you get an approximate factor of two speed up that stacks with the MP, uh, with the semi Lagrangian speed up. So now our overall speed up from cell integrated, when you combine with this upwind communication pattern, is three and a half for the cell integrated method, but a full six times faster for the interpolation method. And it's more accurate because the semi Lagrangian methods don't require. Uh, as much uh, limiting, they're less dissipative. So uh, here we're just comparing those things. And here is sort of the, I'm sorry, I'm going a little fast because we're running out of time. Uh, but here is the performance knot. So here's the low end where the GPUs are happy. Here's the high end where the throughput is happy. Our operational uh, campaigns are all done at this end. Um, green is a standard CPU. Red is the accelerator architecture. Dashed lines are semi Lagrangian and solid lines are the previous Eulerian time step. And we get in the fully coupled model a, a 3.2 speed up for coupled transport and dynamics. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to just quickly mention how we grid course in now. So we implemented uh, what we call a phys grid or a physical grid. Uh, there are some papers that have introduced this idea before we had it. Um, but the idea is you replace. Um, in green, our, our spectra elements here are in green and we replace them for physics columns with finite volume grid at a coarser resolution in red. Um, and you can, you can motivate this by asking what is the effective resolution of your mesh? It's, it's less than you would get by assuming it's the same as the GLL spacing. Um, and so you can use the same remapping operators, the same L2 projectors that you need to do for semi-Lagrangian transport uh, of the cell integrated version. Um, and you can remap back and forth between that finite volume grid. And you can reduce the cost of all of those columns by another factor of two. So now the atmosphere model in the E3SM climate model with coupled physics, transport, and dynamics is twice as fast as it was in version one. And this works out uh, nicely. Uh, you can't even tell the difference. So here is a test where we compare version one with Eulerian transport with physics on the same dynamics grid to version two, which is semi-Lagrangian transport, physics on the coarser grid in a hard test where we have a variable resolution mesh. And they are visually indistinguishable but the one on the right runs in half the time. And then we get to the problem of, do they produce the same climate? So we, we asked the, the climate scientists what variables they care about. So we have this collection of variables. Uh, some of them are annual means, some of them are senior, seasonal means. We compute their correlation of the previous version of the code to our new version of the code. Um, and we present these uh, measures to the climate scientists and they say, it looks OK in the sense that these differences are lower than other differences we've previously accepted. We don't have a, a quantifiable way to measure uh, statistical equivalence and climates yet. So where there are large differences, um, those are the variables that tend to have large uncertainties, like uh, the total precipitation from convection or the total precipitation from large scale. Um, but they found that was acceptable. And so that's in the code now. Uh, and then here are some things we're working on now, which I think I'll skip past so that uh, if you're interested in learning more, we have uh, two feature stories uh, associated with this work. Um, 
I don't know why that got doubly placed there. Apologize for that. Uh, we have a couple of papers. This is our cell integrated transport paper. This is our shape preservation paper. And we have one in review now uh, where we developed a new way to uh, analyze the stability of IMEX methods. Uh, so the, the previous version of just looking at how IMEX methods uh, work on 2D acoustics was suggesting that our time step was stable uh, when our uh, climate model was blowing up. And so when we replaced our 2D acoustics eigenvalue analysis with an, a more complex normal mode analysis, uh, we can show that in fact we were trying to run at an unstable time step. So this paper in review, but it's at GMD, so you can look at the, the, the manuscript now and the reviewer's comments uh, to see how we, we can diagnose better the, the actual stability region of the, the atmospheric time stepping.